So, so hypothetically, if your laptop just broke, oh no. Uh, so today we want to talk about linked lists. We're going to see uh, our new data structure. We know about arrays. Uh, we know about key value stores. Uh, now we want to talk about linked lists, which is a data structure that works uh, primarily on references. So any questions about references would be good to get out there because if you don't know references, today's lecture is pretty tough to follow. This whole week is pretty tough to follow. Uh, so uh, let's reinforce references and talk about linked lists. Before any of that, we want to talk about arrays. So array lists does work off of arrays, just plain old arrays. Uh, so all the concepts I'll talk about apply to arrays. And then a reminder that array lists just kind of pretends that there's extra functionality on top of arrays. Like we can't add to an array. That's something an array list lets us do. Uh, so everything I'll talk about is the computer science concept of an array, even though we use array lists in Java. So an array is a sequential data structure, meaning that order matters. So when you add elements to an array, you expect them to be in that order inside the data structure. Uh, this is opposed to key value stores. You, you probably noticed in 115, I'm sure you were told in 115 at least in lecture, uh, you've seen it in 116. If you add a whole bunch of key value store, uh, key value pairs to a key value store, whether it's an object, uh, an object, a dictionary, or in Java, a uh, hash map, you might not get them in the same order. If you iterate over them, if you print them to the screen, you might not get the same order in which uh, that you added them in to the array. Because order doesn't matter. A key value store is not a sequential data structure. Arrays are. Uh, arrays work off of one continuous block of memory. So when we create an array, we ask for a chunk of memory, and then that's where all the values are stored. The values in an array are actually stored right next to each other in memory. And we say an array is random access because we have a way of accessing any element in the array very quickly and very efficiently. I don't know why this is called random access, but, uh, uh, but we can access any element very efficiently. There's no actual randomness involved, though. An array is fixed size, though. This is kind of an implication based on this continuous block of memory. When you create an array, you create an array of a fixed size. You don't say, hey, operating system, give me an array. You say, hey, operating system, give me an array of size 10. Give me an array of size 12. Whatever size you specify when you create the array, you are stuck with that forever. You can't expand the array. This is because it's one continuous block of memory, so the next memory address, either after or before your array, might be used by another program or it might be used by your program storing different values. You can't ask an operating system, it's just not how operating systems work, you can't ask an operating system for a specific memory address. You can't say, give me this memory address, I want this block of memory. It's not gonna let you do that. You can ask for a block of memory, and the operating system will tell you where that block is through a memory address. You say, give me 50 bytes of memory, and it'll say, okay, I gave you 50 bytes, and here's the memory address of the first of those 50 bytes, and then from there you can find the rest of the 50. But you can't say, give me this specific memory address that's right after my array. Just not how it works. Now again, ArrayList pretends that you can expand an array. The way it does that is if you run out, it'll ask for an array that's a bigger size of what you need, and then if you run out of space, it creates a new array of twice that size copies everything over from the first array and destroys the first array, or lets it get garbage collected, rather. Uh, so it pretends that you can change the size of, an array, size of an array, but you actually can't change the size of an array. Just not how arrays work. In our memory diagram, we showed an array like this. We have a memory address and then two columns for the, keys and val uh, for the indices and values. And we showed it as you know, a sequential data structure, we showed all these values right next to each other because that is how they behave. The values are right next to each other in memory. Just like the stack, we show this name and value as two columns like this. These values are actually in memory, uh, right next to each other in one chunk of memory uh, that we have for the stack. All those values are right next to each other. 
Each individual object on the heap is in a different place in memory, but that object, in this case an array list, is all in one portion of memory. All the values in an array list are right next to each other. Just like our objects, when we create an object of any type, all of its instance variables are right next to each other in memory. We don't know where that object is, it could be anywhere in memory, but all of its values are right next to each other. So this is actually how the array is stored. And then the reference is actually a reference to the first element of the array list, or of the array. Specifically the first byte of the first element of the array. And then we can use this equation to find the memory address for any of the values in the array. So if we're storing 32-bit ints in this array list, well, 32 bits is four bytes. I have the memory address of the first byte in memory for the first value. Well, if I just add four to that, so this first value at index zero is at OX200, that means the second value must be at index 204, the third value must be at 208, the fourth value must be at 212. We're just gonna add four to keep getting to the next element, or just go directly there. If I want the value at index two, I'm gonna take two times four is eight, plus 200 to give me 208, and then I go right to that memory address. I say, hey, operating system, give me the value at memory address 208, and I go right to that value. This is what we call random access. I can immediately access any value at any index in this array. I can jump right there by doing a little bit of math. One multiplication, one addition, and I'm there. I have the location of the value I'm looking for. Very efficient, very fast. And this is why we call memory RAM. We usually just call it memory these days, but it's actually RAM, random access memory. It's one giant array, and we call it random access because we can say, I have a memory address, which is effectively an index. Give me the value at this memory address. It's just one giant byte array. It's an array of bytes. That's what memory is. And we have the ability to randomly access any byte in memory, as long as we're allowed to. The operating system will slap our hand and say, no, you can't access that if we ask for memory outside of what our program's been allocated. But we can randomly access the values that we're looking for. Okay, any questions on arrays? So I'm talking about arrays to, uh, to compare to linked lists. We've talked about this stuff before, but I just wanted some slides to make it concrete. And I want to compare these to linked lists, which, what, which is what we're really after today. So any questions on this? Okay, let's uh, move on to linked lists. So linked list is a sequential data structure. That means order matters. When you add your values to the linked list, you expect to get them back in that order, uh, depending on uh, how you added them. As we'll see in the example, we're going to uh, add them in like reverse order. I was just, uh, I had an issue with Spotify not starting in the last lecture. I think I know what the issue is. I saw it a few weeks ago. It's because I have Spotify on my phone, and my phone and my laptop were competing. So I, I just remembered that, so I had to shut down the app, and then I made sure it was working fine. So if you're wondering what the hell just happened there. Uh, so linked list is sequential. The order matters, unlike a key value store, except they're spread across memory. This is going to be the big difference that we see between linked lists and array. Array is one continuous block of memory. With a linked list, each value in our linked list can be anywhere in memory. They're gonna be scattered all over the place. A linked list is all over memory in a really, really uh, haphazard way, I guess. Uh, and each element of the list, which we're going to end up calling nodes, knows two things. It's value and where to find the next value. And it's going to do that by references. So each, each element of the linked list has a reference to where the next element can be found, which can be anywhere in memory. 
And it's going to use that reference to find the next value. The big advantage to this is variable size. So where an array can't say, give me the bytes right after this array because I want to expand my territory, can't do that. But a linked list says, give me space for another value. I don't care where it is, just give me a reference to it, and I'm going to store a reference to that element, to that next value. So each element of a linked list is going to be stored in a node. These nodes, we're going to write a node class. We're going to create objects of type node, which will have those two instance variables. One, the value that it's storing, and two, a reference to the next node in the linked list. We're going to chain these together. Links, get it? Huh? Uh, we're going to link these together through those references which is why it's called the linked list. It's, it's like a chain of, of these nodes. Uh, and the last element in the linked list is going to have a reference where it would store its reference to the next link in the list. It's going to store null instead. Null is our programming way, programmer way of saying nothing or the lack of a reference. So if any value can store a reference, if any variable can store a reference, if it stores null instead, that means it's not storing a reference to anything. Uh, if you create, for example, a linked list or any variable of an object type, of a reference type, like if you just do player p1 semicolon, and that's it. You don't say equals new player or anything. What it's initialized to is null. You didn't give it any reference to any object. It's initialized to null. We don't get any value, any reference in there. So null means the lack of a reference. There should be a reference here, but I don't have one. There should be a value here. I don't have any value. Null. We say that the list is null terminated when we're using null to specify the end of the linked list. Uh, this is going to come up a bit in 250 as well. Today's a, a good prereq to, uh, to 250 and 220. Uh, 250, obviously, it's linked list. You're going to dive way into the details of linked lists in, in 250 when you talk about, you know, the course is called data structures. You're going to talk about all kinds of data structures including linked list trees and graphs, which we introduce in 116. Uh, but also 220, you're going to see null termination. 220, when you, you, uh, when you write your strings, they're going to be null terminated to specify that you hit the end of a string because you'll be coding in C. And guess what? C doesn't even have strings. You're going to create an array of characters, and that array will be null terminated. When you read a null character, that means that's the end of the string, and that's how you specify how large the string is, is you keep reading characters in the array until you read null. So that's null termination. We're introducing it here. You're going to see it in 220. And depending on what languages you end up using throughout your career, you might see it uh, quite a bit throughout your career. So when we read, for our purposes, when we read null, we know we've hit the end of the list. That's the end of the list. There's no more values to read. No, oh, the, I, I'm regretting that slide now. This came up in the other lecture as well. Uh, when you write your array list in your memory diagrams, you do not have to do those memory addresses like I showed in the slide. You'll see that in that one slide only ever. You're not going to see that again in 116 ever. Uh, and you absolutely don't have to do that in your memory diagrams. Uh, it wouldn't be fair to ask you in your memory diagrams. Maybe it'd be fair, but it'd be, it'd be annoying at the very least, at, at the best. Uh, because you'd have to remember whatever type you're storing in that array list, you'd have to remember how many bytes the representation for that value is. Especially if that value is a, I guess that's a bad example. I was going to say if it's a reference, but references are fixed size. But we've never said the size of a reference. Pretty sure it matters on the size of RAM, how much RAM you have. Uh, but, uh, but you'd have to remember the size of all, all the different values. It, it just, it's not what we want to test you on. We want to test if you understand memory diagrams and how references work and stuff. We don't want you to memorize this whole chart of, okay, a double 64 bits, that's 8 bytes, and int 32 bits, so that's 4 bytes. Uh, nah, we're not doing that. Uh, so no, you don't have to do that on your memory diagrams. I was just doing that as an example for the slide to show how, uh, how indices work in, a, in an array, how they're correlated to the actual memory addresses. Not something you'll ever have to do. All right, so here's our code for a linked list. It's 
specifically linked list node int in the repo. Uh, we're going to get rid of that int on Wednesday and in, in, uh, start expanding on this. For now, our values can only be ints, and we'll fix that on Wednesday. Uh, but this is our first class for our first linked list. We're going to have the two instance variables that I mentioned, the value, which has to be an int in this case, and next, which is a reference to the next linked list node. So we have the linked list node class, and objects of this type are going to have references to other objects of this type, and that's how we're going to link together the nodes of the list. We have a constructor, which, oh, I should just change this to value. Uh, we have a constructor that takes those two instance variables, and we don't have any getters and setters and stuff. We'll, we'll add functionality uh, on Wednesday. Uh, I just want this as simple as possible. So we just have a constructor that sets the two values, and that gives us enough that we need for our memory diagram that we want to go through to really see how this thing works. And then we're going to create a new linked list node, create a new linked list node, and create a new linked list node. So we're going to create a linked list of three elements and link them together through their references. And visually, so I, I had a few slides of text back there. We're going to get into the visuals now. Uh, especially with the memory diagram. Uh, but this is what that linked list that we create with that code is going to look like. And notice that we only store a reference to the first node of the linked list, which we call the head of the list. So in that code, we have a variable named first, which is going to store our linked list. It only stores a reference to the first node of the linked list, which has the value three. And its next is going to be a reference to the next node of the linked list, which stores the value two in this example, which stores a reference, also stores a reference next, a reference to the next node of the linked list, which has the value one. And then next of null means we've reached the end of the list. So we only store a reference to the head of the list, but we can use the head of the list and just keep following dot next, dot next, dot next to be able to get to the end of the list, and we know we've reached the end because we've reached null. Actually, we won't do dot next, we'll do uh, dot get next, but uh, to keep the, the clutter out of this example, we don't have the getters there yet. And then we reach null, we know we've reached the end of the list. Will we do get, get next? I don't know if we do, I don't remember. Okay. Memory diagram this thing. Okay. Uh, uh, before that, any questions on the structure? And notice that that we do get. Actually, uh, any questions? Let me stop there for a second. Is that the structure of a linked list? Like that is linked lists. We got a whole week of linked lists here, but that's that's really the crux of it. That's the the foundation, the structure of it, uh, and then we're just gonna explore how that works, and then add functionality to it for a week. Okay. So in, in this code, we're creating a node with one, then two, then three. But you notice in the previous slide, we actually end up with the list three, two, one. So we're creating this list backwards by manipulating these references and through the memory diagram, we'll see exactly how that works, but I'll explain through the code um, before we get into that. We have the constructor that we saw, which sets the instance variables. We're gonna call that constructor with the values one and null. So we're gonna create a linked list node with the value one and a next of null and store it in a new variable type linked list node called first. And just for the memory diagram, I'm abbreviating to LL node. Uh, this line in particular was like way out here. It was intruding on my memory diagram, so I had to cut it down. Um, so first, it's going to store this node, which is effectively a linked list of size one. It stores the value one. Next is immediately null. So we know we've reached the end of the list right from the first element. And then this line is the first line that trips up a lot of students. So I wanna, I'll explain this well now and when we get to it in the memory diagram. We're gonna create a new linked list node with the value two and a next of first. 
where first, so the right-hand side of the assignment operator is evaluated first. So when this is evaluated, when first is evaluated, it's storing a reference to this linked list node with the value 1. So this is a new linked list node with the value 2 and a reference to the node that stores the value 1 and a next of null. And then we're going to reassign first to be a reference to this new node that we created instead of being a reference to this node. So we're updating the reference stored in first. This is something you've seen a bit in, in 115. Uh, I think it came up in, did it come up in 116 yet? But like when you change a certain value, you have to reassign the new value back to the variable that you had. Most notably in string concatenation, I think that's the first time you'd come across this in 115, where you'd concatenate two strings, you just do this string, variable str1 plus some string literal, and then you'd say, why didn't str1 update? Well, it's because you have to assign that value back to str1. So you have to say str1 equals str1 plus whatever string I'm concatenating. If you don't reassign it, you don't see the change. You computed the new string, but you never did anything with it. Here we're computing the new linked list by prepending the value 2 to it, but we don't see that change until we reassign that to the variable, variable first. Now first contains a reference to that node, which contains a reference to the next node. And then we do it again. First equals another new linked list node with next of first. At this point in time, first stores a reference to this node. So first at the end stores a reference to this node three, which stores a reference to the node with two, which stores a reference to the node with one, which refers to null. So we end up with the list three, two, one. This is what we call pre-pending. We're adding elements, but we're adding them to the front of the list. So we're pre uh, creating a new list with the value 1, pre-pending 2, and pre-pending 3, as opposed to appending, where we would append to the end of the list. If we were appending, we would actually get 1, 2, 3 instead of 3, 2, 1. So that's what the code does, or at least that's what I claim. We'll trace through it in, uh, in excruciating detail excuse me, detail, and see if it does that. Does garbage collection not occur even though the address of first gets updated? It does not occur. We had this question in the first one, too. I should just add these answers to lecture. Uh, good question, also. So do, does garbage collection apply? So first got reassigned to a new linked list node. So would this node be garbage collected? The answer is no. It will not be garbage collected. So an object can only be garbage collected if we lose all references to it, if we can no longer access that object. But we actually will, and this will be more clear when we get into the memory diagram details, we can actually still access this node that's highlighted after this line of code executes, because we can say first dot next, dot next is going to be a reference to this node. So we still will have a reference to it, we can still access it, so Java won't garbage collect it. If we can access an object, even if we don't have a reference to it directly on the stack, if we can access it in any way by following any number of references, then it doesn't get garbage collected. Uh, we did see this briefly uh, in the player example, we created, or the party example. We had a party object which stored a reference to an array list and that array list, we didn't have access, direct access to from the stack. We didn't store a reference to that array list on the stack anywhere. We can only access it by going to the party object and accessing its members variable, which was a reference to the array list, and then accessing the array list. But that array list doesn't get garbage collected because we could access it in one way or another. If you can't access it in any way, it doesn't get garbage collected. So the reference doesn't have to be exactly on the stack. Uh, though if we lost this reference, if we said, uh, like after all this code, we said first equals null, then the whole list gets garbage collected because we can no longer access it at all. Okay. So some of this should start looking familiar. The, the part of creating an object and having a 
uh, having a constructor call. Let's go through it quickly. So we have a constructor call, new LL node of one null. So we're going to create a new object of type LL node, put it on the heap, create its two instance variables, all the variables that are declared outside of all the methods. Give it a random number. I was feeling 350 when I made this slide. Put the call for the constructor on the stack. This is a reference to the object that's being created. Fail is 1. Next is null. Run the constructor code, which sets the instance variables to the constructor parameters. And we have an object that's created. And then the constructor returns a reference to the object that was created. And my next slide's going to be wrong. <laughs> I, I was trying, I was frankly updating the slides as I was doing my laptop before lecture. Um, this should be val on the stack. Uh, it's going to be value for the rest of the slides, but that it should be val. It should be the name of this. I was kicking myself at the beginning of the lecture. I should just rename this to value. Uh, it would have been a lot easier than updating every slide of the memory diagram, but uh, but I ran out of time. So it's going to be value the rest of rest of the slides, but it should be val like this. I think that's innocent enough that you all know. You all see what's happening there. I hope. Um, Is it possible to append the null at the end? Yes. Uh, it depends exactly what you mean by that. So is it possible to append null at the end? So if we set a next equal to null, that's us saying this is the end of the list. So we have the end of the list here. If we want to append null, if I take that for face value, it doesn't make much sense because the end of the list is always going to be null anyway. So appending null would be, wouldn't really have any effect. But we can change next. Like if we said first dot, uh, not at this point. But if we update this next, instead of 350, we replace this with null. We say this next equals null. Then we'll effectively cut this node out of the linked list. In this case, we wouldn't have access to it anymore after the, the next step of this anyway after this reference is replaced. If we replace this with null, we're cutting this node out of the linked list, then it would be garbage collected because we can't access it anymore. And we'd effectively have a list that's just two instead of two, one. Uh, so it depends exactly how, if I'm interpreting your question right or not, but. Um, but you can, the nice, one of the nice things I should say about linked list is that you can, you have a lot of control over the structure of a linked list by manipulating references and, in your case, adding null where you want. If you want to cut the list in half, go to the midpoint of the list and set its next equal to null, and the whole second half of the list is gone now. I guess the only other way I could interpret that is a value being null. Uh, you can set a value equal to null if that's what your specific application calls for. If I want to do a new LL node, null, comma, first, something like that. I don't think I can. I don't think you can set an int to null. Um, but if that was integer with a capital I, you could set it to null. All right. Let's get back on track. Uh, so this constructor call returns a reference to the object that was created, which is a linked list node. So first is effectively a reference to the head of a linked list of size one. It just stores the value one. Next is null, so it's the end of the list. Just one element. Then we're going to call new LL node of two first. Again, this is what trips a lot of students up. And uh, messing up the order here is a, an easy mistake to make, thinking that this will be a list of one, two, three, because that's the order in which values were added. Um, that's an easy one to grade. If, a TA is looking at this and sees one, two, three, like in your, uh, well, we don't have the full code up yet, but when this prints to the screen, if it's one, two, three instead of three, two, one, that's an easy one. Put a big X through it. Try again on the second try, uh, second try quiz. Um, it's an easy mistake to make, but it also shows that you, you're not following the references and actually tracing through the memory diagram, tracing through the code and drawing the memory diagram. 
Uh, if you're doing that, you're trying to shortcut things usually. You say one, two, three, you just draw all three things, and then you're like, oh crap, I gotta put my constructor calls on there too. Uh, it's really easy to mess that up if you're not diligently going through the code line by line. Uh, so that's an easy one uh, to grade at least. Uh, so going through this the right way, let's go through it. We're gonna evaluate the right side of the assignment operator first, which is new LL node of two first. Okay, we're gonna create a new LL node object, give it a random reference, I was feeling 200. Put the constructor on the stack with 200, a reference to the object being created as this. Two being the value, and the one that can trip people up, the, the tricky part, is first. What's the value of first? Now it's whatever the value of first is when the constructor is called. So the timing here matters. When the constructor is called, when this line is being executed, it's before the assignment is made, so it's what, whatever first was before we got here, which is going to be 350. So next is going to be a reference 350, a reference to this object right here. And then the constructor assigns the instance variables equal to the constructor parameters. We get two in OX350. And then we return a reference to the node that was just created. So we return the reference 200 and we reassign first. We reassign it the value 200. So first no longer stores a reference to OX350, it stores a reference to OX300, uh, to OX200. This is a very important to have the assignment operator here. If we don't assign, we'll still create this object, it'll still have a reference next of 350, but first would still be referring to 350. We wouldn't have any reference to 200, so we created this beautiful object, we're creating this linked list. We did in fact create a linked list of size two, storing the values two and one. But if we don't store a reference to that new node in memory, it's like we didn't even do anything. First will still just be the list one and then null. And this new node that we just created would be garbage collected, it would be gone. If we didn't have first equals. We do have first equals, so first now stores a reference to the new head of the list that we prepended to this list. And now first stores a reference 200 with a value two and a next of 350 with a value one with a next of null. So now first is a reference to a list storing the values two and one, which is what we wanted. Then we do it again. So new LL node of three first. First, at that point, when the, this third constructor is called, is going to be OX200. So next is OX200. I came up with 480 for this object that's created. And first is reassigned to that new reference. So at this point, we have first only stores a reference to the first node of the linked list, or the head of the linked list. So first stores the reference 480 with the value three, which stores a reference to 200 with the value two, which stores a reference to 350 with the value one, which has a reference to null. So now we have the list three, two, one in memory that we built up one object at a time. And each one of these nodes can be anywhere in memory. It's whatever we get when we ask the operating system for space, wherever that operating system decides to give us a chunk of memory, that's where they go. We don't care where each element is. We just care that we have a reference that we can find where we can find it. And we're going to store that reference either in a next variable, if it's not the first element of the list, or right in a variable on the stack in this case, if it's the first element in the list. So we're manipulating references. It's a lot of references to be able to, um, to, be able to get this linked list working. So first, 480. Reference, reference, could be anywhere in memory. We just hop around memory and get these values. Any questions?
Yes. How do you reference a previous variable? So it's so like these 350 and the 200, we no longer have them on the stack. You mean those ones? So we would follow the next references. So if we did first, if we did first dot next dot, uh, yeah, dot next dot, and then value, we could get the value one. So we would use the next references to be able to navigate the linked list and get to the value we're, we're looking for. We'll move on. I know this is tricky stuff, especially the first time you see it. So if you do have questions, please please stop me uh, so I can explain it. I know there are questions. I just don't know what they what exact questions are out there. And if you don't have questions, we're about to get some because we're going to throw two string on here. And yes, it uses recursion. So we're going to see recursion. This is the second wave of recursion that we're going to get hit with all this week. Uh, and I'm going to use recursion for all my linked list examples. Uh, so is Paul. Like, we're going to use recursion for linked list. On your homework, I encourage you to use recursion. Uh, it's about the same difficulty, in my opinion, uh, to use either a loop or recursion. I'm not even going to show you how to use loops. If you want to use loops and stay in your comfort zone, you're on your own with that one. Uh, I'll help in office hours, I guess, but I'm not going to show it in lecture. I'm going to show recursion in lecture. I recommend you get used to recursion because when you get to trees, there will be a significant gap in difficulty. It will be way easier to work with trees using recursion than using loops. I've only seen finally two. I can finally say this. Uh, it's off of zero, finally. Two students ever in 116 who did anything with trees that didn't use recursion. They actually used loops with trees. And they only did that as a challenge, as an extra challenge to themselves. And I'll throw the same challenge out when we get to trees in three weeks. So in three weeks, when you're working on task six, or in four weeks, I guess, when you actually get started on the task, five weeks, because that'll be spring break. Um, when you're working on the trees homework, you'll be using recursion, or else you'll be really, really struggling to use loops with your trees. So I recommend, a lot of you won't follow this, but you know, whatever. Uh, I recommend that you use recursion now with linked lists when the recursion is a lot easier so you can get practice with it so when you get to trees, you're not completely overwhelmed with learning all of recursion because you denied yourself all the practice leading up to it. So I do recommend using recursion on your linked list homework on task three, which is released. I didn't announce that, but task three is out. Um, I do recommend using recursion for the linked list, uh, link list things. Because if you don't, if you go into trees and uh, you're trying to learn trees and recursion simultaneously, that's tough. Uh, so hopefully you already got some practice with recursion when we first introduced it two weeks ago. But uh, it is what it is. All right, so let's add this to, oh, I didn't even explain the two-string. So I'll explain this a little bit, but the memory diagram will do it more justice. Uh, so with two-string, we could just do system.out.println first, we can do that, and then first we'll call, uh, first, uh, print line will call toString for us. I want to be more explicit about that in the memory diagram, so I'm going to explicitly call toString, and then store that in a string, and then print it to the screen. We're also explicitly calling toString here. Uh, it's something you don't see all the time in Java code, the explicit calls to toString. Uh, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Here we're going to explicitly call it, just to be very clear about what we're trying to do. We want to call the two-string method and, uh, and trace through it. So we're going to call two-string, first dot two-string, first dot two-string. So from this node, we're going to call the two-string method. So this in the two-string call is going to be 480. We create a variable out, assign it the empty string, immediately replace that with this dot value. This dot value is three. So we get the string three. Um, Paul set this up. I don't know. I might have done the same thing. But uh, we have to convert this int into a string 
And one of the cleaner ways to do that is using string concatenation. So we're creating an empty string, so we get a very simple string concatenation here, converts the int to a three for us. Then we don't have to explicitly convert from an int to a string, which isn't the craziest thing, but it's uh, not what we want to focus on for this example, to say the least. Uh, if you want to do that, it's string.value of, and then the int as, a, as an argument. Um, so out plus equals, I, I mentioned that because uh, that's what I was updating on my slides, getting all these empty strings. I missed that in my memory diagram, and I just went right to three, and that was wrong. Um, so out plus equals this, out is replaced with the value three, and then we hit this conditional, the bigger thing that we want to talk about that I was focused on making the slides. We're going to hit this conditional, and we're going to check. We're going to ask ourselves a question. Are we at the end of the list? We're going to ask this by checking for null. Is next equal to null, or rather not equal to null? If next isn't null, then we're not at the end of the list, and there's more work to be done. And then we're going to make our recursive call. So if we're not at the end of the list, we're going to take out, which is just the value of this node as a string, and concatenate it with a recursive call to two string. This method is calling itself, so it's recursive, on the next node. So this dot next dot two string, going to the next node and saying, hey, whatever you are as a string, I'm going to concatenate my value as a string to that and then return that. So we make a recursive call on this dot next dot two string. So from this node, we're calling two string. So this in the next recursive call is going to be OX200. So we get OX200. It creates a string out of empty string, immediately replaces it by concatenating it with the value, which the value this dot value two. So we got out equals two. We're going to make the same check. Are we at the end of the list? If we're not at the end of the list, there's more work to do. And there's more work to do because we're not at the end of the list. This dot next, that ain't null. So we got more work to do. We're going to make another recursive call. This time, this dot next dot two string from this stack frame, this dot next dot two string. We're at this object when the method is called. So this is 350. Out equals empty string, immediately replace it with this dot value of one. And now we check our condition and it's finally false. So we check our conditional, this dot next, this dot next. It is null this time. So our condition is false. Let's check it for not null. Our condition is false and we've effectively hit the base case of our recursion. That means the recursion stops, we're not making another recursive call, and we're actually going to return something. We're going to skip the if and just return out. So we're going to take out, which is the string one at this point, and return that back to the previous stack frame. This stack frame was sitting right here, waiting for this method call to resolve. That method call just did resolve. The stack frame ended. Uh, and a reminder, when I'm graying out my stack frames, that's the same as crossing them out. Uh, that stack frame ended, gave control back to the next stack frame on the stack, which is this one, and gave it the value one. So this resolved to one in this stack frame. This is one. Out was two at this point. So we're gonna concatenate two space one and replace out with that value. So out is now two space one. We continue with the code. We hit the end of the if block. We hit our return statement and we're returning two space one back to this stack frame. This stack frame was sitting right here waiting for this call to resolve. It got two space one out was three, so we're going to get three, space, two, space, one. So this stack frame 
Uh, what, when we're running the recursion, this stack frame didn't do much. None of these stack frames did much. That's one of the beauty th beautiful things about recursion. Each stack frame doesn't do much, and your code doesn't really do much. But it gets a lot done by creating a lot of stack frames. So this stack frame got its value as a string, so three as a string, and said, oh, I'm not the end of the list. Bless you. So there's more work to be done. And it didn't do any of that work. It just said, hey, next node. It talked to this node and said, hey, can you turn yourself into a string? And that node said, yeah, sure. Hey, next node, can you turn yourself into a string? And this node said, well, I am the end of the list, so I am my own string. Returned it. This string, this node concatenated, returned to here. And at that point, this resolved to the rest of the list as a string, which in this case is two space one. So the rest of the list as a string, and then all it's doing is taking its value and appending it to that string, and then finally returning three, two, one. So we give three, two, one back to the main method. Main method stores it in value. And notice we only called two string on the first node, just on this node, but that node talked to the rest of the list and got the entire string for the entire list and prints it to the screen. Isn't there a built-in two string method? Does defining a new one not create an error? So there's a built-in two string for every object you create, but it'll it would print out week four dot ll node at and then some random hex value which isn't really what we want. If we wanted to print out the actual values of the list, we'll have to write a two-string method like this and then have it print out whatever we tell it to print out. Could you print a linked list to the terminal? What would be the outcome? So this is, I mean, this. If you did it without this, it would be whatever.